the plan for today is I'm gonna I still have some stuff that I need to do for solo basically um, so I'm gonna finish that up okay and then we may have some time at the end to discuss a gym of glue but more likely we're gonna do it next week so I'm, I think I'm gonna say we stick to the plan of the the reading plan for Ajimoglu, so do three through six on Tuesday, and then we can just sort of talk about all of that at once. Um, because kind of the more the more I think about it, the the first few chapters of Ajimoglu are kind of like just saying the like the stereotypical intro to a an essay. They're saying what they're gonna say, uh, and then the, after that they start saying it. Um, so I think it might be actually better to hold off on it a little bit so we can just see kind of what the, um, how the argument progresses. Okay. Um, and, and we're going to, we'll have a little bit more sort of specific examples of how they, they propose that this, this whole thing is, this argument is going to sort of apply to different scenarios throughout, throughout history. Right. Because I think a lot of, you know, they're sort of putting forward this grand historical narrative um, sort of a mechanism for why countries grew the way they did. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of specific examples and there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, I would say, I mean, I guess all, all countries are important in their own way, but there's a lot of countries where it's sort of like, oh, how do you explain this? How do you explain the rise of China? How do you explain um, Latin America, the political instability there? How do you explain the Meiji uh, restoration in Japan. How do you explain divergence between Europe and like kind of China uh, in the, the East um, during the Enlightenment Industrial Revolution? How do you explain the Industrial Revolution? All of that, like it's sort of like you can constantly barrage them with questions, sort of hypothetically, uh, whether their theory can explain this. And of course, their theory can't explain everything, um, but they kind of try to anyway, which maybe it wasn't the best idea, but they, they in some ways, I think they kind of try to explain everything, uh, which, you know, so, so that's sort of a, potentially a fool's errand. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's how I kind of think about it is they're putting forth a fairly broad sweeping um, uh, mechanism for, for why growth occurs or doesn't. And our job is to kind of interrogate that. Okay. So, and the, I mean, that's, that's what they do kind of, they go through and, and talk about specific instances throughout the book. Okay, so um, yeah, so in that sense, I think it's better actually to, to get down a few chapters and then um, talk a little bit more about it. Okay, and I think the, the stuff that we'll do today will provide some kind of analytic foundation for that. Okay, because um, I think and it's sort of partially what they're building off of too as economists, right? So, or as what, well, Jim Ogle is an economist, and then Robinson is, he's an economist. I, I think, I actually don't know what he is, but he, he focuses a little bit more on development and, and political economy. Um, but yeah. So yeah, so we're going to continue on with Solo today. All right. And it, what we're going to do, so last time we talked about um, uh, basically this, uh, we, spent, we spent a lot of the time talking about this issues of, okay, you have basic solo, just kind of, you know, capital accumulation going on, what happens when you change stuff, okay, and for the most part, it was, it was sort of, you know, clear, it was sort of, you know, more of good stuff, more of good technology means more output, and so on, um, but in the case of something like savings, which is more of a, you think of more as a choice, although it's not in this case, um, but you think of it as a choice, uh, there's some ambiguity about the effect of savings on, say, consumption and everything like that. Okay, and so at the end, we basically, you know, we, we found out you know, what what is the savings rate that maximizes uh, consumption, okay, in the long run, like the long run steady state consumption. Um, and it turned out that it was just that simple, you know, you, if, if your parameter alpha is 30%, you save 30%. And, and so on. Okay, so so S equaling alpha is the golden rule. Okay, um, yeah. And so so that that tell that'll tell you. Okay, because you know saving more means more output, but also you're consuming a smaller fraction of that output. You know, so that's sort of this this uh, tension there. Um, that tells you where you actually do maximize it in the long run. Okay. Um, now, 
and then at the very end we talked about sort of like okay well what does this mean um in term maybe in terms of something like we would actually observe okay like does this generate any predictions about savings rates that we might expect to see okay because we're still in an exogenous savings rate world we still just say you know you save 25 percent of your uh, invest 25 percent of your output okay uh as a country okay so and w kind of the argument that i made was it you would never go beyond the the, st the golden rule savings rate okay because if you go beyond that you actually you have less consumption in the short run because you're saving more and consuming less out of output and you actually have less in the long run and so it's sort of there's why would you ever do that okay so you, the the um, golden rule also does provide a sort of a weak test i would say of the theory um in the sense that it tells you you would never expect to see savings rates quite this high okay um yeah so then uh now you know so where there, there's more you can do along those lines about thinking about the savings rate because it, it's a pretty important per, kind of parameter for for a country or a society of any sort um so sort of how much you know you, you're thinking how much do, I, do we value the future versus the present day and that determines what kind of investments we're willing to make not just sort of like capital style investments but also sort of um you know uh like major uh, national level investments like you know like basic research things like that um do you do you want to make those investments for instance like later on we're going to look at the creation of the internet and things like that do you want to make those investments given that they're going to have potentially you know large benefits but but also uncertain and also you know maybe a decade or two down the line um so so those are big societal uh, decisions that are made okay so um just saying that it's a fixed number maybe isn't the most um rich description of the world okay uh you know and so the the next step after solo and this is this is more if you were to um I don't know, maybe in a different class or if, if you were in, in grad school or something like that would be to actually think about that savings rate not as a fixed parameter but as the output of some optimization right so you would think about it as um sort of your your you can think about it as you're a social planner um and your your uh state today you have a certain amount of capital you see that there's a certain level of productivity in the economy and you make that decision like how much of this are we going to set aside for investment and how we, how much are we going to consume today and you're going to do that take into account like sort of your utility function how much you discount the future and all these things and also how much you expect to produce in the future and things like that okay so that the next step would be to sort of think about that as an optimization problem okay um, and the way I described it was like that's that's the way I described it was really like as a central planner. Of course, that's not currently uh, mostly in the U.S. Uh, at least how things work. Um, it's more decentralized. Okay, and so you can also look at like a decentralized version of that where there's a bunch of people making individual sort of balance. You know, do I buy this? Do I take out a mortgage? Do I buy this with a credit card that I can't necessarily pay off right away? Um, those types of you know consumer finance decisions and but then at the end of the day those people constitute the economy and that and that that leads to some aggregate savings rate okay once you add it all up okay so that's the other way it's sort of the micro founded way of thinking about this societal decision okay but right now we're really everything all of that detail and richness just is like s which is like 20 percent, right so um but still we get some you know sort of we we see the implications of those choices, if not the reasons why they were made. Okay. Um, all right. So then, yeah, so that's, that's, that's one thing we're not going to go down that road, but that's, that's a road, you know, um, you could go down if you, if you, if you started, if you were interested. Okay. Um, what, the one thing we are going to do today though, is kind of go, go down the more technological road in the sense of thinking about what, uh, how do things work out when you have, long run technological growth okay and in some sense this picks up the thread of sort of malthus into solo okay so like you know if you think of malthus was bad you know sort of pretty objectively bad outcome uh as a prediction of the malthusian model and then we move to solo where things get better because you don't converge through sort of overcrowding down to that subsistence level you actually converge to some 
fixed level, remember? So um, you converge to some fixed, say, output per capita or some fixed uh, consumption per capita, right? And it's a function of basically your, your productivity, that Z parameter that we had, okay? So then basic solo, so, well, that's good. We've converged to a level, okay? And, and actually, um, you know, I, I never showed that that level had to be better than subsistence. It could be that your technology is really bad and solo would predict an even worse outcome than Malthus. But in practice, at least sort of post-industrial revolution, it, it seems like whatever level of technology that we have is better than subsistence. Okay, we're, we're pretty good. Okay, um, and so in that sense, so you know, even basic solo just with a fixed level of technology is better than Malthus. Okay, um, it's not like exactly that I was that that we were like, well, this outcome is normatively bad, therefore we need another model. I mean, the outcome is also positively bad in the sense that clearly we don't any longer live in a Malthusian world, and we may never have. Okay, so. It's, it's it's really it's not driven by normative concerns it's driven by positive concerns of is this does this look like a realistic description of the world that that we have you know that we do live in or that once was around okay um and so that that that's good but then even it doesn't really pass that positive step because we do also see you know in many countries uh, almost every country really large increases in the standard of living uh over time as well okay and so that's Baseline solo, where you just converge to some fixed but kind of not so bad level, is not good enough because it doesn't capture that growth component. Okay, which is really kind of the most important thing that we're going to think about in this class. Okay, so um, yeah, so that that's the final piece of the puzzle, really. Once once we do that, we'll actually have a, a model that gives you sort of what do you see in the say the U.S. or the world overall in the 20th century in terms of uh, growth. In, in economic growth, all right. So um, yeah, so it's it's not so bad actually. In in fact, it'll it'll be the steps that we'll take will be similar to the steps that we took uh, before. I can just add in a few extra details. Okay, so so this is um, well, first. I guess we should go to the notes. Okay, so this is going to be solo plus. I'm oh, sorry, tech technology. All right. I mean, solo has technology in the first place, but it's going to be technology that's getting better over time. Okay. Um, all right. So then, what? How does this work? Well, okay. Let's let's go back to basics here. Okay. And just write down sort of the primitives that we have to work with. Okay. So this is still this is basically always going to be our production function. Okay. There are other production functions in the world. Many, in fact. Uh, but this one is pretty easy to work with. It doesn't seem terrible, okay? Um, and it actually has some nice properties in a also in a positive sense. And you know, it, it, if you just assume this, it gives you kind of results that don't seem so bad, okay? Um, actually, I should I should talk about that more at some point because there is some stuff that I with regards to how do we choose the production function that I kind of glossed, or either glossed over or just forgot to, to cover, okay? Um, I'll talk about that. Maybe I'll talk about that after I do this technology stuff because I just sort of hyped up the technology stuff and I don't want to get sidetracked. I'm easily sidetracked though. So um, I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later, all right? So, but for now, this is our production function, just like before. Now, the, the thing we're going to add is continual growth in in this z parameter okay and that was what's that going to look like well it's going to look like what whenever else we have continual growth in a parameter we're going to say that that growth rate um is some positive number in this case i'm just going to call it g okay maybe i should call it gz but i'm just going to call it g so in, yeah it's it's g okay so it's it's just some exogenous thing it says the technology level grows at two percent a year okay and um, it's exogenous in our world right now, but of course it's the result of uh, many different micro level outcomes and decisions. It's the result of uh, people thinking up new ways to do stuff, okay? Either because they, you know, they have a job and, and they do that job and as they do it, they find new and better ways to, to accomplish things, okay? And maybe they tell their friends and, and coworkers and, and so on. Uh, or maybe they're scientists and it's a little bit more kind of focused and directed and they, they do some research and, 
have a eureka moment and come up with a new idea. So there's many different ways um, that can happen. Okay. Um, maybe, you know, and, and in addition to that, it's like, there's, there's kind of two components. One is what I would call the state of the art. Okay. Someone coming up with just like a really genuine, like genuinely new way to do something. It's obviously going to improve kind of technology overall, but there's also the diffusion component is, you know, if one person comes up with a really new, great way of doing something, that's awesome. But if they don't tell anyone, that's less good. I mean, it's not as good as it could be, right? So the diffusion component is like, okay, you improve the state of the art, but you also want to diffuse the state of the art, okay? Um, and that doesn't always happen, right? If you look at Newton, he like he invented like you know Newtonian gra how to like formally think about Newtonian gravity physics. He also kind of simultaneously to think about it, he needed to sort of invent calculus, okay? But he was very reluctant to actually publish it, and because he was like, he was a little bit of a weird dude. Um, he was very like shy and, and didn't want to publicize his stuff. But it was obviously incredibly, you know, new and useful uh, ideas. Okay, but he eventually they they sort of, you know, convinced him to do it. Uh, but he was he was a little slow on the uptake. Okay, so um, also Leibniz kind of simultaneously invented calculus, but that's another story. So. Um, yeah, so, so there's a diffusion component, and, and it's true. I mean, if you look in, in the world today, it's like, you know, s certain countries are using what appears to be more advanced technology, and, and it takes time for different types of technology to diffuse uh, out. Okay, so that that's a kind of a big thing. Um, and, and, you know, now, and then you might think there's, that changes over time, right? Because like, you have the internet, we have like Wikipedia. It's like diffusion must be getting easier, you would think. Okay, so... Um, that's another component to, te to technological growth. Okay, so a lot going on there is what I'm saying. Um, and we're just, again, I feel, I guess I feel some sort of guilt about taking all this complex, these complex situations and summarizing them with a single number, but it's what you have to do if you want to make it, you know, you need to simplify and uh, think a little abstractly if you want to like get concrete solutions and answers to things. Okay, so we're going to do that. We're going to say the Z number just grows at some fixed rate G. Okay. Um, okay, so then, and actually, did I? Yeah, so the homework that I have, remember the homework is due on the 9th. So that's this, this the next class from now. Okay. Um, I, yeah, so then in that one, actually, I, I, I actually go in Malthus world. I actually, we, we do endogenize this growth process for Z a little bit, right? Because, so just as an aside, in the in the homework, we say that Z is equal to eta times L. Okay, so that this is eta. I remember, like nowadays, I'm old, so I kind of know all the Greek letters. When I remember when I was an undergrad, maybe I wasn't very knowledgeable on things, but I was constantly confused about which Greek letters were which. This is an eta in case you guys didn't know. If you knew, that's awesome too. Um, so uh, so the, we just said, so eta is some number, and it's just saying like every person is just sort of ambiently thinking up new ideas. Sometimes they're good, okay, and that, that increases Z. And let's say there's a small world. Everyone tells each other about stuff, okay? So um, that's an example of an endogenous, kind of endogenous uh, rate of technological growth, right? Because here we're just saying it's a, a number, on the left, we're just saying this number G, 2%, whatever, right? Here we're saying it's it's still kind of, I mean, it's two numbers multiplied together, but it, it's it's an L is something that's changing over time too, right? So it's kind of interesting. It, it pushes the envelope out a little bit and saying, okay, well, it's, it's proportional to the amount of people you have, okay? It's still saying that everyone just kind of randomly kind of exogenously thinks up ideas at the same rate. Like, it's not like people are choosing ADA. They're not like, oh, I'm going to spend... 10% of my day thinking of new ideas and 90% doing back-breaking agricultural labor, okay? And apparently never sleeping. Um, no, they just kind of just fix random, you know, shower thoughts or whatever, okay? So, um, yeah, so that's that's the idea. It's, it's a partial indigenization, I would say, but not like full, like you're making choices op optimally with some utility function and stuff like that, okay? So so that's cool, but it, I mean, and that, that, one I, that problem I think ends up being cool because it kind of changes the Malthusian outcome a little bit, okay? Um, but we're, we're going to stick with just the constant growth rate G, okay? Um, all right, so what, is that, what does that get us, right? 
Uh, let's see, how should we think about this? So, okay, I don't want to, sometimes, you know, either myself or other teachers, they, they, if you go through a problem, it's like part of the if difficulty of solving a problem is even knowing what the right approach is, right? And so sometimes I or others may say, okay, well, here's the problem. This is how we're going to approach it. Let's do it, all right? Um, but that first step of how do I approach it is, is often or even always, almost always the hardest part, okay? So um, let's, I want to try and keep some focus on that, okay? So, uh, and, and so to do that, let's, let's think, first, so let's think about what do we have kind of available to us, okay? So we know our production function. That's obviously very important. We know now we've assumed a growth rate for technology. Uh, we've we've con we're continuing to assume an exogenous growth rate for uh, uh, population L the, of n, okay, some positive number n, right? And then finally, um, we're continuing also to assume that you know eff effectively the rate of change of capital is just our investment rate S times y, right? So we're in investing a fixed fraction of output y into new capital minus delta k, all right? <clears throat> and uh, actually, let me check one thing. I need to, I just wanted to make sure that I'm doing this consistent with the, what I have in the notes. Ooh, yeah, okay. I realize I, I changed things up a little bit in the notes. I'm gonna change one thing about the production function. Okay, I'm gonna so that it's consistent with what I have in the lecture slides. Okay. Now what I'm doing is very it's not a big deal. Okay, it, it, this everything I said basically is still true. I'm just kind of changing the notation and I'll explain what that is. Okay, so first I'm changing Z into A. Why? Because that's what I have in the slides and that's often the the what people use when they do things like this with the long run technological growth. Okay, so it's I'm just re literally renaming Z to A. They happen to be the first and letter, last and letter is the alphabet. I don't know if that's a coincidence, but I, but they, it just happens to be the case. So um, that's that's the first change I'm making. Hopefully that's not too disruptive. Uh, the other thing I'm doing is I moved Z, which is now A. Okay, I'm gonna do it from the front here uh, into kind of being attached to L. Here, okay, so it's not a big deal. In fact, it's just a number, okay, and it's multiplying the production function, okay. It's just I I moved it a little bit, okay. So, and and that um, sort of allude, it's sort of related to this notion of of different types of technological change, okay, which is actually something that we're going to talk about as as the class goes on more. Um, so. Not all technological change is the same, okay? Uh, sometimes technological change um, can be kind of more related to capital or more related to labor, okay? So, um, and, and, it, and really what it, what it amounts to is sort of a notion of, auto, like if you think about, think about automation, okay? So automation is, it's like making, a, a, let's say robotic automation you create a new type of capital, okay, that just kind of replaces labor, okay? So it substitutes for labor. Okay, that's that's more sort of capital uh, related technological change because it's, it's, a, it's a difference in the nature of capital and also it's not labor, it's like substituting for labor, okay? Um, the alternative is, uh, is more complementary to labor. So it's more like a machine that makes labor more productive, right? So I don't know, a welding torch or something like that. So something is like, you need the person to operate each individual one and it makes that person more productive, okay? Um, so that's more complementary, okay? So if you think about, if you've seen those, I don't know, like um, in an auto, a modern day automobile factory, uh, they have those big robots like Waldo's with arms moving around. Not many people there, just kind of like, you press the on button, make sure everything's, running smoothly um that's that's more the substitute like robotic automation kind of thing um and then yes yeah, so like the welding torch any tools stuff like that is more complementary to humans um and so it's going to be it's 
it's kind of good in that sense for humans, right? Because it makes us more productive and it makes potentially the demand for us higher rather than lower. With automation, with robotic automation, kind of the demand for humans may go down, okay? Which is, it's kind of bad in a lot of ways, okay? Um, it's good for some people if you own the capital, but it's bad for like a worker, say. That, that's got a fixed set of skills, especially. Okay, so um, now you can see here, I, I attach it to the L's. I'm, I'm saying this is more uh, labor augmenting, okay? Labor, uh, complementary to labor, okay? Um, it, it turns out that it doesn't make a big difference with this particular production function for reasons that I'm not gonna go into, but just think about it as, as this is kind of labor augmenting technology. Okay, so it's not gonna, it's not the kind where you like, you make a bunch of robots and all of a sudden like, you know, there's like tens of thousands of people in Detroit that, that don't have a job anymore. Okay, so um, that's all. Okay, so we changed the name from A to Z, from Z to A and we moved it a little bit over to, to, to be attached to L. Okay, um, all right, so that's, that's that. We have a chat, let's scope that out. Uh, this lecture is recording. I remembered, but thank you for reminding me. That's very, um, yeah, you should remind me if, if I don't say anything, okay, because I forgot last time. Uh, I got my grad students doing that too, all right? So thank you. Um, okay, so then, and now everyone leaves, like I can watch this later. Uh, okay, so the, it usually takes like a, a day or two for YouTube. They have to screen it or something. Um, so uh, let's, let's proceed, okay, so now, you know, I got kind of sidetracked because I forgot about the, the ZA thing, but we have our uh, law of motion for capital. This is really the workhorse here. This is the most important starting point, okay? Um, so, yeah, I was, I was talking more earlier about, you know, we need to know how do we think about how to approach these problems, okay? So the the whole, kind of the name of the game in, a, in any problem, like the, this sort of solo problems, is... We have the, the issue is that things are growing over time and we want them to grow in proportion to one another. Okay? Or like they will and, and we want we're happy for them about that and, and we need to analyze them under that assumption. Okay, so um, and for things to grow in proportion to one another, first of all, you need them to have um, growth rates that are sort of not they, that are converged to something, okay? When, when a growth rate goes off to infinity, that's really bad. That's like a singularity. So I mean, maybe it's good, but it's, it's probably bad, okay? It's, it's bad sort of mathematically, okay? You want things to converge, okay? So like capital, for instance, and labor, they're growing exponentially, but their growth rates, we want those to converge to fixed values, okay? So, so we're gonna look for solutions of that nature, okay, of that variety. Um, okay, and so then that's, that's why we, we do stuff like we look at, okay, what is the growth rate of capital, okay? All right, so just you know dividing here s y over k minus delta so just taking that equation on the left dividing by k all right so um <clears throat> yeah so so even this right when we write this the simple equation down in the growth rate of capital what it's it's saying something to us and it's saying if we want the growth rate of capital to be constant eventually we need well we need we want the thing on the left, cap, growth rate of capital to be constant. The thing, it's the thing on the right, and we want that to be constant. Okay, so delta is already constant, so that's fine. S is constant, so that's fine. But for this thing to be constant, we basically need y and k to, to get along and, and eventually to grow at the same rate. Okay, so if we want this, this quotient here, this ratio to be constant, we need eventually for y and k to be growing at the same rate and so that their ratio will be constant. Okay, so, so this is, remember, this is gk. If, so if we want that to be some constant eventually, we need JK, GK to be equal to GY. Okay? Or, you know, I mean, which is kind of equivalent to Y over K being constant. Okay? All right, so now um, that's, okay, so, so that's the kind of stuff that we want to, we want to constrain, like, what kind of world we're looking for, okay? Now we can go a bit further here in this case and plug in for what actually we know Y to be, right? So we know that Y is K to the alpha, AL to the one minus alpha, and that's now divided by K and then minus delta, all right? 
Um, and this actually simplifies a bit, so we can say, okay, well, this is S, combine those Ks, so the K to the alpha minus one, and then AL to the one minus alpha, okay? And don't forget about delta, all right? And then the last thing we can do is, is those, that K term and the AL term we can combine, because you know one is the alpha minus one, one is the one minus alpha, but those are just negatives of each other. So this is actually gonna be equal to S times um, AL over K to the one minus alpha minus delta, right? And this is here, K dot over K. Okay, so, so I just, you know, just sort of what we're saying is, okay, well, K, K to the alpha minus one is one over K to the one minus alpha. So that's why we can combine these two terms. Okay, and that's actually useful because that gives us another, just like we saw above that GY should be equal to GK, which is still true. Um, this gives us another relation that says like, basically this thing should also be constant. Okay. And what, is, what does that mean? Well, that basically means that the growth rate of K should be equal to the growth rate of AL. Right, that's that, that, you know, that, that ratio of rule. Those two things should be growing at the same rate. Okay, now the growth rate of AL, it's the, you know, it's the growth rate of A times L. We know from our growth rate rules that should just be the growth rate of A plus the growth rate of L. Okay, so the product, the growth rate of a product is the sum of the growth rates. That's the, that's the product rule for growth rates, okay? So G, K should be equal to G of A L. which equals GA plus GL, right? So that's the product rule there. And then we are, we're calling GA just G. Okay, like remember up here, um, like over on the left here, I, I just called it G, okay, so that's G. And then we're calling GL N, okay? So that's this assumption here about, about um, the growth rate of the population. Okay, so um, so that's it. So, that, so this is saying that GK, that capital, should be growing at rate G plus N. So we are, and, and those are both constants that we're assuming we know, right? Okay, so we, we kind of, we actually know what one of the answers will be. What is the long run growth rate of capital? Well, it's just G plus N. So if G is technological change is 2%, let's say N is also 2%, then it's saying that overall capital should be growing at 4%, okay? And then we also know from above that that should also be the growth rate of output, total output, not per capita, but total output, right? Okay, so then, right, so that's that's kind of how you go through and say, okay, we want things to be balanced, meaning they should have a constant growth rate, and that means, that gives us sort of ratios that we need to, to hold up, okay, and, and remain constant over time, all right? Okay, so that's uh, useful, okay, it turns out. Uh, it's useful because, okay, well, now we kind of know what's going to happen, but also um, we know what's going to happen in the long run, let's say in terms of the growth rates. Uh, but it's also useful because it, it, it gives us insight into how we should be normalizing things, okay? So if in the long run we know that uh, output and capital are gonna be growing at rate G plus N, which is like how AL, A times L is growing, okay? Then we should probably normalize by AL, right? So before when we just had L, we normalized by L. But now we have A kind of attached, we're gonna normalize by that too, okay? When we're, when we're coming formulating a, a solution here, okay? So what does that mean? Um, so we're gonna normalize. So we're gonna define these these lowercase variables. So before I defined little k to be capital K over L, I'm just gonna kind of redefine it, okay? Um, to be capital K over A times L. All right, so now that A is in the game, I'm gonna, I'm gonna include that in our normalization. Okay, and then I'm gonna do the same thing like I always do for output. Okay, and so what we're gonna do here is 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 similar to what we did before, which is convert in, this aggregate model into a normalized model. Okay, it's convert the aggregate solo model into normalized solo model. Okay, um, all right, and so, so the, you know, the, the one thing we can do, um, and actually I can just work right from here, is is think about well, what's 
Oops. Let's see. Z's done. Uh, we can think about, well, what is that lowercase y? If we plug in for capital Y, all right, we're going to get this. So just that plugging in for capital Y on top, AL remains in the bottom. That's going to be K to the alpha. AL is just going to be now minus alpha, combining those terms. Okay. And then this is just, if we combine those exponentials, it's K over AL to the alpha. Okay, and then that k over al, we know well, we know that's little k, right? So that's little k to the alpha. Okay, so if you just just to summarize, you know, at the far left we have y, and at the far right that's equal to k to the alpha. Okay, so it really it just comes down to this very simple relationship between these normalized variables. Okay, so just saying, the more you know, so, so remember cap these, these lowercase variables are sort of their they're not per capita anymore. They're sort of normalized by both population and technology. Okay, but we can, <clears throat> you know, if we if we do eventually figure out a value for little k, right? We can get real capital K by just multiplying this a and l over to the other side. Okay, so if we want to get, you know, we we kind of find the answer in this sort of fantasy world of lowercase letters. If we want to get back to sort of the real world, if you want to call it that. Uh, we just multiply these over and say, okay, well, whatever we found out for a little k, multiply by al, that's going to be sort of real aggregate k. All right? So we can always map back and forth uh, with these normalizations. Okay? Um, so that's the production function. Okay? And then the other thing we want to normalize is um, our uh, law of motion for capital. So that's just like it was before. That's the S Y minus delta K. All right. Um, so here, uh, you know, um, so I guess I'm, I'm kind of being a bit redundant here, but uh, you know, so we can think about this in terms of the growth rate. Okay, so that'll give us S Y over K minus delta. Okay, so that's gonna be useful. Um, now, if we wanna convert this into a law of motion, right, for now little k, all right, we can just sort of do it directly and say, okay, well, what's the growth rate of little k? That's going to be the growth rate of aggregate, capital K, minus what? So so if you look over here, over here, so it's going to be the, the growth rate of little k is the growth rate of capital K minus the growth rate of L, A minus the growth rate of L. Okay, so minus a okay and we basically know what all these things are right so these are all in the either the with for k we, we have it right here uh, on the left where to go there it's uh, we have it right here on the left and then for a and l we we just assumed those were numbers okay so all right um so let's plug that in so we get s y over k minus delta that's k dot over k we, we said that a is, the growth rate of a is just g, and the growth rate of l is n, okay? So that's that's it, all right? Um, that's our growth rate, okay? And then the last step, almost the last step, is, well, we wanna have everything in terms of lowercase variables, okay? And then the only kind of thing that's left over that's a capital is these y and k uh, variables here. But, but what we can do is, that you know the the ratio of capital y to lower, to capital k is the same as the ratio of lowercase y to lowercase k, right? So if we divide this top and the bottom by al, all of a sudden those both become lowercase numbers, right? Okay, and then here I'm going to combine these, right? So does that make sense? You know, we're because k, k and y are normalized by the same al factor. The, the ratio of these two capital letters, if you just look at like, kind of dividing these two equations, the ratio of the capital letters is going to be the same as the ratio of the lower, the lowercase letters. So the, the ratio of capital Y to y, capital K is going to be the same as the ratio of lowercase Y to lowercase K. All right, because it's just dividing top and the bottom by AL of this, you know, of, of this fraction here, just dividing top and bottom both by AL. Okay. Um, all right, so that's 
Okay, so that's that's almost it. All right, so this is everything is in lowercase variables. Okay, the la the last thing we need to do is we're just going to say okay, well we know little y from this equation here. It's just k to the alpha, and then kind of simplify it a little bit, and then we're going to get the answer. Okay, so let me I'm a, I'm out of space here, so let's. I wish to create a new page. Okay, so let's start a new page here. So, uh, okay, let me just, I'll just rewrite what we had before. So from the previous page, we had arrived at this. Okay. Um, this is what? So this is S. Now we, we said that Y is going to be K to the alpha over K. All right, and then we can just divide, we can just move this k over to the right side, okay? That's gonna give us k dot is equal to what? S k to the alpha minus delta plus g plus n times k. All right, so this is our other main equation here. Okay, and that looks very similar to what we had found before. Okay, you know, I mean, you really just, before we went from delta to delta plus n. Okay, and now we, we've added in this plus g because we're also normalizing by a. So you, you can see really what happens is usually we just get an extra sort of effective depreciation rate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's, that's kind of it in some sense. Um, so so what, what outcome does this generate? Well, just like before, um, you know, this gives us that k dot equation sort of is the whole game, right? So if we think about as a function of k, right, you have this investment component. Um, sorry. We have this investment component here, some concave function, and then we have this depreciation component, okay? So it's like that investment component, that's k to the alpha. And then depreciation component delta plus g plus n times k. That's just a linear function. And there's that intersection. Okay, so what this gives us is some you know steady state uh, k star. Okay, so in this case it's like saying that steady state is gonna satisfy where k dot is equal to zero. Okay, so it's going to be whatever k solves this equation. Okay, and just like we saw a couple times before, it's going to look something like this. You do the algebra, which is not particularly enlightening, but it's going to look something like that. Okay. Um, all right. So, so you, so the first thing is there's no more z in here. Right, there used to be a z here. The the z is now part of this normalization. Okay, so what this tells us is that this normalized, remember this is this is k over al, that normalized uh, capital level converges to this thing, right? But since a is, is growing, right, that technology component um, is still incorporated. It's just, it's not in the level, it's in the growth rate, okay? You can also find um, y star, right? So y star is just k to the alpha. Remember, y little y is just k to the alpha. So it, that's going to be, you know, this thing up here, but with an alpha, another alpha exponent on top. So I mean, it's, it's going to look very similar. That'll look like this. And remember, this is, um, you know, y <clears throat> over al. Okay. This is y over al. All right, so then, okay, so, so what, and, you, and again, it doesn't have the z. All right, so what's going on there is basically this this a, remember I said you can convert back to sort of the quote unquote real world, right? So you can, you can do that here, right? So you can say, okay, well, y over al is equal to this thing. Okay, so that means that like, let's say we're interested actually in uh, just y over l. So y over l, that's actually per capita output. That's like the, standard of living that we've we've been talking about so much. Well, that's just going to be a times 
that constant that we found, that y star, right? So that's delta plus g plus n here. Okay, so so then here, if you look at it like this, it's saying the standard of living is you know, some constant, which is maybe interesting, function of parameters, times this a, which is itself growing exponentially over time, right? So that technology is in a, it still shows up in the, um, you know, per capita income, all right? It just shows up like through the normalization instead of through the level, okay? Um, all right, and then everything I said about all the stuff we did with the golden rule and consumption, that's all still basically true, okay? It's just that this, this we have now this exponential growth in the standard of living, okay? Which is kind of what we're, we've been going after for a while now, okay? So now I've really escaped the Malthusian world. We've escaped the sort of static, basic solo world and entered into the modern <clears throat> era of growth. Okay, so, um, yeah, and, and you know, if, if you want to think about this in growth rate terms, okay, so it's G, what, what is the growth rate of this Y over L, the standard of living, which is a, you know, that's a big headline number that people are always interested in. Um, well, it's, gonna, it's just going to be G of A, right, so remember the product rule says that the growth rate of y over l is the growth rate of this a times the growth rate of whatever this is, okay? But this thing isn't growing. This is just a number, okay? And a fixed number like this, even though it's a, comp I mean, it's a composition of many numbers, which then become another number, uh, but it's not growing anywhere, okay? So it, its growth rate is just zero because it's constant, okay? So so it's just, you know, the growth rate of in, uh, alpha per capita is ga, which is which, which is calling g. Okay, so at the end of the day, I mean, it's very simple. We, we assumed a fixed rate of growth for technology and that ends up being the exact rate of growth that we expect for um, <clears throat> the for the economy, uh, for the you know our main economic indicator, which is output per person, okay? And then if you think about consumption, so consumption is just a fixed fraction of output, so that's also gonna grow at the same rate. Right? So if you multiply a constant on top, if you had another constant here, it's not going to show up in the growth rate, so to, it, the growth rate of consumption will also be just G, G consumption per capita. Okay, so um, yeah, so so that's that's pretty much it. Okay, um, now you know, it's, so so that's good. I mean, we sort of achieved one of our positive goals was was like sort of how do we make a relatively simple model that gives us what we see. Um, in sort of the, say the US in the 20th century in terms of growth, okay? Because if you look at the, you know, if you look at the US, uh, you can you can look at a variety of different indicators, but let's say you look at either output or, or consumption per capita, um, stuff like that. So if you, if you look at like say log of Y over L, okay, this is in the log space, right? I mean, it, it really is, you know, it's sort of, it's almost a straight line. So I'm gonna draw a straight line. That's sort of like if you ran a regression on it, okay? And I mean, in truth, it's like, you know, this, and there's like depression, World War II, and, and stuff like that, okay? But it's it's very close to a straight line. There's just like sort of a heartbeat at like depression, World War II, and then you go back. Okay, so um, it, it, it to a first approximation, a constant rate of growth is actually pretty much what happened, okay? Um, now, you know, that, there, there is question of does it slow down after you know in the 80s and 90s or does it even get slower in the 2000s? Okay, that's there's not really enough data to say that, especially given how noisy it is. But that's a question. But really, for most of the 20th century, it's basically Australian. Okay, okay, so that's that's good. We that that's that's one thing we've achieved. Okay, um, now you can add stuff to this, right? And the the way that you would add stuff to this is is to think about sort of additional factors, okay? And <clears throat> you don't think about additional factors just because you're bored and you want to think about, oh, what if I added this or what if I added that, okay? Because clearly this is a very, very simple description of a complex world, okay? We have capital and we have labor and we're just, they're just two numbers in the technology. Um, so, so there's... Clearly, if you, if you want an accurate description of the world, you're going to need to add stuff. Um, but there's also another force, which is sort of, you know, we, we at some point do want to compare this or at least um, map this into some 
data, okay? And so you can make a super complex model if you want, but if, if you can't observe half the things in it that you're talking about, there maybe isn't that much of a point in doing it because you, you can you neither sort of calibrate the model to try and match the re real world. Um, you can't test the model to see if it's accurate. Okay, so you want to have stuff that's, at least reflected in in real world data okay but you know that that the reverse of that is if you have some real world data out there maybe that that's the first thing you would consider to incorporate into your into your model okay and so so kind of what what are examples of, of stuff that i might be talking about well um <clears throat> probably the biggest thing is either something things other than capital and labor okay so maybe we have different types of capital Okay, and and the big thing there would be start ha start making a distinction between physical and human capital. Okay, because those um, they're different. I mean, they have different properties. Okay, um, and also they they're kind of measured differently. Okay, so a lot of human capital is probably more difficult to measure. With with physical capital, you generally have records, at least just for taxation purposes of people buying machines because it's often it's done by businesses um, building structures building roads stuff like that like we have pretty good records in that kind of thing now human capital we do i mean we do have good records one thing is that it's 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 investment and it's substantial investment i mean you guys know that because you're paying for it right now um it's substantial investment but it's done on the part of individuals right um so that's one thing is, is it's probably easier to track stuff that's done by firms because they they're, they're a little bit more systematic and tracking that sort of stuff um and it's also sort of heterogeneous right it's it's uh and and it it's in the sense that like some 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 you everyone pays the same amount right some people are going to get more out of a given class than others or out of a given a year in university right for a bunch of reasons. Um, and so it's like you, you, you see what they paid, but that's sort of a, only a noisy signal of what they actually got out of it, okay? Because, I mean, it, it it's, a, it's a signal in the sense that they expect to get something out of it, hopefully, uh, but it's a noisy signal, okay? Um, and then the other thing with human capital is that it's just like, like I was talking about before, you know, these people randomly thinking up new ideas. Sometimes it's not it's not like on the books. It's not a market transaction in any sense, right? It's just you were doing something and you thought of a new way to do something, uh, or you learned something while you were working. Okay, and the, you never paid anyone for that, or you just kind of did it, um, and and it was never recorded. Okay, so you might think that there's just so much, too many differences in how these things operate and how they're measured that it's worthwhile to think about them separately. Okay. Um, yeah, so so you can so you could do that, right? And the, and the way you would do something like that, so let's let's sort of zoom in on a, on human capital here. Um, and I have a bit in the uh, in the lecture slides about this too. So the the way, and I just want to make sure that being consistent with the notation. Yeah, so so the way I I would say we should do this is say, okay, well, and this is also super simple, but it's a start. Um, <clears throat> We can define. We're gonna we're gonna say just capital H. That's gonna be our human capital. Okay, that's a very crude aggregate. Okay, so that's saying like the total amount of human capital in the whole country or the whole world, which is sort of an absurd notion, but it's just sort of adding everything together. Okay, um, and you and you can think about that as sort of saying, well, the total amount of human capital is equal to the amount of human capital per person, which call call little H. Uh, time sale. Okay. So maybe in your conception of the world or how you measure the world, like H, little h, is like some function of how many years of schooling into the average person has, and then L is just the population. Okay. So this, if you thought about it like that, it'd be sort of like capital H is like the total number of person years of schooling that are around in the economy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, but, but now this is. It's in a, embedded in this here is an assumption about how different people's human capital kind of relates, okay? This is saying that like, there's, there's kind of no complementarity going on here. It's just like, if I have an extra year of schooling, that doesn't affect you, right? There's, it's, we just add everything together linearly, okay? Um, that's the assumption here, which, which probably isn't true because it's like, 
in any given workplace, you need people with different skills, right? Um, you can't just have everyone having the same exact, you know, degree or whatever, uh, or set of skills. Um, and so there's that. There's always complementarity between different types of human capital, uh, and for that reason, it's it's not clear that we can do this. But to a first approximation, let's say that we can. All right. Um, okay. And so then we just sort of have some measure of the overall level of human capital. Okay. But we we can just yeah. So so if we do that. And, and we're, what we're going to do is also kind of change up our production function a little bit, okay, and say that we're going to have k to the alpha, we're going to have a, but instead of l, we're going to have h. One minus alpha, okay, so we just replaced l with h. Okay, so now this, what, this, what this really is saying is that not kind of, you know, I'm not speaking innately, I'm speaking like after schooling and everything like that. Not every person has the same sort of productivity, at least, you know, especially for a given task, right? Different people are going to be more or less uh, productive at a given task, and that's probably going to be related to their training and their skill set, right? So um, that's kind of what is, that's what, what's behind putting H here instead of L. It's like you don't just count the number of people, you count the number of people but weighted by their training level, okay? Um, that's why we put H there. All right, and if you want to sub in for that little H, right, you can write it as H, or say A times H times L, right in there. That's that sort of fungibility of, of human capital assumption embedded. Okay, so this is an L, this is an H. I didn't think I could write H's and L's that looked the same, but I managed to. Okay, so A times H times L, right? So if you want to sub in for that, that's equivalent, basically. Okay, so... So that's how you would you would incorporate it, okay? And then um, where do you go from here? So 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 first of all, in the background, okay, we would we would maintain the same assumptions about capital, the same assumption about labor, uh, L dot over L is equal to N, and the same assumption about technology. Okay, I'm getting. You know, sloppy here, a dot over a equals g. Okay, uh, same assumptions about technology. Okay, and then the question is, well, what do we assume about h dot? Is that somehow endogenous, right? Do people, you know, because we know that um, you know, people make uh, human capital, you know, education, training decisions. Um, maybe they make it. It's not always clear what the the main parameters are. I mean, it's like think about like just the the question of if, if you're in a good economy versus a bad economy how does that affect your uh decision to get more schooling right so you might like let's say for like a master's like something that people kind of are often sort of on the fence about um you might think well like, it's a bad economy i'm not getting a job anyway let's get a master's that's what i did when i got a phd um around 2008 so uh when i started and so that's one rationale. But then the other, there's another rationale, which is like, okay, well, it's a good economy. It's probably going to be good for a while. So let's get some education, and I can go into the workforce as a highly trained, you know, uh, highly paid person, whatever. So you could kind of think about it either way. It kind of it depends on a lot of different nuances. But there's some process behind H. Maybe it's it's more just everyone goes to school for a certain amount of time, and that's it. But you know, there, there's and in, in that case, it would be kind of constant but but there's some process behind that okay so i'm not going to go into what exactly you would you would do for that um although the, there is an interesting example when you start thinking about instead of if, if you generalize the notion of human capital to include like artificial human capital like ai basically then you can get kind of weird interesting results not like a singularity but like a change in the nature of growth okay so we'll I'll talk about it someday, but I don't think we have time right now. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how you would you would you would come up with some process for H, and it would, that sort of encodes what you think of your, what your your sort of assumptions are for that, um, and then go from there. Um, the other thing I kind of want to note is the way, just functionally, the way that A and H show up here are very similar, right? They're just a thing that augments labor, okay. Um, and this is actually something that people think about a lot, okay, which is like, what's the difference between 
technology and education because they're both basically uh, reflective of the amount of knowledge that people have, right? So, so education is more personalized in the sense of like, I want to get educated. I want to learn this thing, which is difficult to learn. And so I'm going to probably pay a lot of money and spend a lot of time and put in a lot of effort to do that. Okay. Um, whereas technology is kind of more amorphous. It's just out there and like, you just sort of bump into it and you're like, Oh, cool. I now I know that. Um, so, so they, you, they, conceptually, you can think about them as different, but they, they do often blend into each other, especially if you think about it too hard. Okay, so, um, and I think maybe the, you know, sort of the distinction that I would make is, is one that I just alluded to, which is like the difficulty of absorbing that knowledge. Okay, so education is more like, damn, this is tough, right? Like learning calculus the first time, that's difficult. Um, and so it takes, you know, time and effort. It's not just sort of like, something where you're like, oh, wow, that's a new way to, to do something I hadn't thought of. And it's pretty obvious what to do. You just like, it's a, some physical technique. I don't know how to use a can opener or something like that. Um, or how to, yeah, I mean, like maybe like you think about like agricultural techniques, a certain way to uh, plant crops in a certain order. Like once you know it, it's just like, okay, I'm going to do that now. And someone told me that it works. So why not? Um, so that's that's one of these like the ease of absorption of the knowledge uh, will distinguish technology from education, okay. And and the other thing is sort of um, yeah. And so what sometimes people that sort of relates to what people call the embodiment of technology. So it's like uh, of, of knowledge. It's basically like education is more like embodied in people, okay? Because like you need to know has this person learned it? Has this person learned it? Has this person learned it? Right? Whereas technology is, is disembodied. It's like, have we discovered this technology? Yes, good. Now we can all use it. Okay, so it's like, those are kind of the same thing, but sometimes people call it embodied versus disembodied to distinguish them. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's that's the sort of like an additional step you could take. And it, and it's, it can be useful because um, we observe human capital. Okay, we across time and across countries, we get pretty good measures, at least of say how many years of schooling people are getting. Okay, and we're looking at countries where, not just like, you know, the U.S. Like most, you know, I think the vast majority of people complete say high school. Um, but you do globally, you see you know, there's many differences. Not um, uh, that's not going to be true for all countries. Okay, and that's not going to be true for all time periods. Okay, so it's something there is of quite a bit of variation in, um, in terms of the the number of years of schooling. Okay, now there's the question. How do you map from number of, of years of schooling into, say, this little h? Like, what is is eighth grade as useful as twelfth grade? Is there decreasing returns? Are there increasing returns? Okay, uh, what about college? Right. So, that's all a big question, and, and it's it's a little bit more difficult to answer, especially because a lot of primary education is not traded on the market. Right. If you go to public school, you don't. I mean, you kind of pay for it, or you don't directly pay for it. Right. So. Um, that, that makes it harder to observe, right? When you see something paid for, you get an idea of its its value or the expected value, but with with the public good, it's a little bit harder. Okay, so yeah, um, and there's a bunch of other stuff you can add in the difference between buildings and machine structures, blah blah blah. We won't go into that, but you you can you can go wild, all right? So um, yeah, so next actually so so yeah, next time we're going to talk about finally why nations fail. Um, the you know, up, up through the, the chapter six. Um, and at some point we'll talk more about how do you, how do you in fact map this stuff into the data? Okay. And can you learn anything from that? And it, it's, it sort of turns into an accounting exercise where you say like this much of growth is coming from technology versus capital versus human capital. Um, so we're going to do that as well later. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm out of time. Um, I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, thanks for coming. And uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. That homework, don't forget, is due kind of before class on Tuesday, basically, um, on, on Canvas. And uh, if you have any questions, just you know, shoot me an email. Um, happy to discuss things uh, most of the time. All right? So thanks.